Hey everyone, happy Sunday morning. I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you today. We're trying something new, as you can see. I um, <clears throat> had a great time at the wedding with, with Kristen last week in Dallas, Texas. Childhood friend of 30 plus years. Um, so it was a really good time with, uh, with Frank and his wife. Uh, and so we're sorry that we missed last week, and I'm sorry that I had to miss again this week because of Army Reserve training. And hopefully I'll have an update about that for the entire church um, very soon, possibly next Sunday. I hate being away from you guys, but I thought instead of continuing on in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14 today, I would instead uh, share with you something that stood out from my personal time in the Word recently. Usually when I'm, when I'm reading, <clears throat> I'm highlighting, underlining, and, and making notes in the margin for potential devotionals or messages sometime in the future. So, today, I want to push pause again on the Gospel of John. We'll pick that up next week, starting in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. But today I'm going to look at Psalm 17. And for the sake of context, we need to dive into, we'll start at verse 1. Uh, but, the, but the verse that I'm really concerned about is verse 15. It's the last verse. And that's the one that we're going to be focused on here this morning. So please uh, look up Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 17 on your phone or you know on your Bible. And uh, let's read together. Hear me, Lord, my plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart, though you examine me at night and test me, you will find that I have planned no evil, that my mouth has not transgressed. Though people try to bribe me, I have kept myself from the ways of the violent. Um, and basically David says in verses five and six, uh, that he has been following, um, the, the narrow path and, uh, his feet have not stumbled. He says, I call upon you, God, answer me, turn your ear to me, save me. And in verse 9, we really see what the major issue is. He says, the wicked are out to destroy me, and my moral enemies surround me. They close up their callous hearts. Their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down and now surround me. Their eyes are alert. They throw me to the ground. They're like a lion hungry for prey. Rise up, Lord. Confront them. Rescue me. Save me from the wicked. And then he gets to verse 15. So a little bit about the context. It's really a prayer of David to the Lord for vindication, for protection against the wicked. But he almost closes this psalm with a verse that contains four or five truths, depending on how you number them, that David is absolutely confident of. So, verse 15 in the NIV says this, As for me, I will be vindicated and will see your face. When I wake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So, depending on how you calculate these, um, he, he presents four or five facts, future facts, in which he is absolutely confident. Of. Um, I also wrote down the New King James Version, which is slightly different, but let's see if we can go through these and, and list these four or five facts in which David is taking confidence. Verse 15 says, As for me, I will be vindicated. This is really the, the, the Hebrew word for righteousness or justice. So I, I think that the NIV translators were correct in translating this vindication because the context here is, hey, all of these enemies have come against me and I'm going to, as for me, I'm looking forward to the day when ultimate justice is going to be melted out, especially to those who've harmed me. And we know that there is going to be a day of ultimate justice to come. 
He also says, when I will see your face. Now, the New King James Version flips those two and says, as for me, I will see your face. And instead of saying something about vindication, it says, I will see your face in righteousness, which is also true. So the New King James Version and the NIV translators have both made a decision based on this Hebrew word, which I think are both true, perhaps two sides of the same coin. NIV says, as for me, I will be vindicated and will see your face. Uh, New King James Version says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. In other words, David is confident that he will pass away. But when he passes away, uh, there is going to come a time where he is going to be declared righteous in God's sight, which is completely true. We know that those who are in Christ, who are covered by the blood of Christ, will have will have uh, imp uh, 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 imparted upon them the righteousness of Christ. Um, but we will also see ultimate vindication against the wicked, which is which is true as well. So the first two, righteousness or vindication and or vindication, and we'll see your face. Then he says in the next phrase, when I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So he's confident of a resurrection. He's confident that total, complete satisfaction will one day arrive, will one day come. And again, depending on how you calculate this, this could be a repeat of what we've already seen in the first line. Or this could be something slightly different. He says, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. Now, the New King James Version says, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So that's slightly different. Seeing the likeness of Christ and being uh, resurrected in the likeness of Christ. So let me see if I can summarize here. David's really struggling in this poor period of his life. He's got a number of enemies. He's crying out to the Lord for help, but he kind of finishes this psalm with a note of confidence in four or five future facts. And here they are. That ultimately, true eternal satisfaction can only be found in, one, a bodily, physical resurrection. He says, I will awake. Two, in seeing God face to face, in knowing him intimately and personally for eternity. That's two. The presence of God. Truly experiencing the fullness of the presence of God. Three, being made in his image. Um, and four, being granted perfect righteousness. And the flip side of that coin would be seeing that ultimate justice is melted out against all sin and all wickedness. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> last week I was at the wedding and I've been meditating on something for years now. That the wedding provided an opportunity for further thought as it offered an illustration of this concept that I've been thinking about. And it deals with satisfaction. So let me just ask a question for a moment. What is it that brings you the greatest measure of satisfaction in life? When are you most satisfied? What brings you the most satisfaction? If you were to ask me that question, I would probably say, um, you know, quality time with my wife, spending time outdoors, uh, running, fishing. Um, I would say working hard with my hands or working hard on some project and seeing the results of my hard work. That brings satisfaction. Or probably in the ultimate sense, being used of God in a significant way way, in a significant ministry way, through service or giving, or generosity, counseling, whatever it may be, um, and knowing that I, I played a role in what God was doing in the lives of others. Now, no matter what you list, what brings you the greatest satisfaction? What brings you the most satisfaction? No matter what you list, I suspect, like my personal list, that all of those things are just temporary. They just provide temporary satisfaction. They they wear off. It wears out, you know. 
there's there's no permanent satisfaction in even the enjoyments that are provided us um, here in in this life. And it's kind of like ever since I was saved, there's there was great joy in salvation, but there was also an emptiness in my heart that has never dissipated. In fact, I I would say it's probably that emptiness, that desire has probably grown over the years. And I, I don't mean that I'm not aware of the source of, of satisfaction. Um, so just to clarify, I'm not, I'm not searching for the source of satisfaction. I already know that satisfaction is found in Christ. It's kind of like I'm on a journey and I know that true satisfaction will not totally be felt, not, will not totally become a reality until I get to my destination, but I'm not there yet. So I'm on the path, but I'm not at the full destination yet. And thus, I'm, I'm not experiencing the fullness of what David is, is kind of describing in, in verse 15 of, of Psalm 17. So according to David, true satisfaction can only be found in God, can only be found in eternity. But my question, the question that I've always thought of is how much satisfaction can I experience this side of heaven? And so as I was at the wedding, my thought was this. So for the bride, this is a very special day. Um, there is so much to be joyful and excited about. There are the beauty of the flowers and the decorations. Um, there's the, the friendships and the conversations. There's the, the wedding vows. There's the ring. There's the, the amazing food. Um, but all of these things, the entire wedding experience, the entire day goes by very fast. And when it's over, it's over. And in some sense for the bride, it's kind of like there's a high level of satisfaction. Hopefully, if you can truly enjoy the present as you're going through your special day and the reception to follow. But once it's over, it begins to maybe vaporize and, and slowly, that level of satisfaction slowly begins to diminish. So ultimately, her only source of true or perhaps her greatest source of satisfaction has got to be in the groom himself. So here's the illustration that the Lord kind of brought to my mind is uh, there are many good things in this world. It's kind of like the wedding and the reception, many good things that we can enjoy and we should enjoy those. But ultimately, in the midst of enjoying the world, um, we need to realize that there's no ultimate sense of satisfaction in what we have around us because it's all temporary. That the only true location, the only true source of satisfaction has got to be in the groom himself. And or if you want to extend the illustration a little bit further, uh, the honeymoon to follow. And in this case, the honeymoon might be uh, the thousand year reign of Christ and, and entering eternity. You know, our honeymoon was like 10 days. So it was significantly greater than the one day or one afternoon of the wedding and reception. So the wedding reception is, is life on this earth, whether it be 50 years or 100 years. And there are many good things that we can enjoy and we can we can find a measure of satisfaction in the things of the world. But ultimately, true satisfaction has got to come from our relationship with the groom. The groom is Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Uh, and it's got to come from that relationship. So <clears throat> I feel like my heart has been trying to find satisfaction in the wedding reception. And the here and now, you know, the world. And another part of my heart is longing for more. And realizes, as David so eloquently points out in verse 15, uh, that 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 what it's longing for is only going to be found in eternity. It's only going to be found in the groom. And so I'm kind of happy, but I, I'm sad at the same time. And uh, there's many good things to enjoy, but I you know, recognize the true source of satisfaction is yet still to come. So how do we, or is it possible to grow closer to the groom here and now in order to best position myself, in order to maybe reach out toward heaven and pull it closer. 
as I'm reach out toward my ultimate destination and pull it closer, maybe shorten the path a little bit? Is there any way to, to pull eternity closer um, and experience a deeper, more satisfying relationship with the groom, the bridegroom of Christ now um, in, in this life? And that's been a pursuit of mine for, for many years. And I'm frustrated because sometimes, a lot of times, when I want to pursue God, I get distracted by the world. When I um, really need him and I, and I seek him, he seems to be distant. And at other times, you know, I, I, I do. I admit I turn to worldly things for joy or for satisfaction or for fulfillment. And inevitably those wear out, they wear off, and they kind of leave you empty. Um, and that true satisfaction escapes me. So, and I think this feeling is going to continue until the permanent arrives, permanent state comes. Uh, but can can we experience more in Christ? Does, does Jesus have more for us, more satisfaction, more fulfillment in him? Is it possible to draw closer? And that's that's really where I'm headed. I know I've said the word satisfaction quite a bit. <clears throat> so let me summarize. I'm going to search for satisfaction. I have deep emotional, spiritual, you know, physical, mental needs. And I'm still experiencing a degree of emptiness because I've realized that there's nothing in this world that can truly satisfy what's in my heart. Only God can do that. And only eternity. If we were, if we were originally made to live in the presence of God for eternity and sin messed it up and Satan messed it up, then our hearts are longing to get back to that perfect world that God created, to the perfect body that God had designed, to the perfect relationship that he had in mind. Um, and so I know that perfect satisfaction is not going to be possible in this life, but only can be found in the life to come, which was what David's point was in Psalm 17. But how much can we truly experience satisfaction in this life if we intentionally attempt to draw closer to Christ? So there's two methods of doing that in David's life. And those are, let me, to use another illustration, let's just take a football illustration. I hope this is understandable. So there's two aspects of drawing closer to God. Is one, we learn about him. And that might be um, David in Psalm 119. He was a man who loved the word of God. He was a man who studied the word of God. He tried to implement the word of God in his life. How do we fall in love with God's word and seek more about God through his word? Um, more truth about him and more about who he is through his word. I think that will definitely help us grow closer to, to Christ over time. But that's kind of like um, if you wanted to experience a football game, that's kind of like watching the highlights on your phone or talking to a couple people who were at the game or watching a few interviews or reading a few articles. That is completely different than actually going to the game as a participant, as a spectator yourself. So on one side, we have the word of God, which we can draw close. We can press in to know more about God. But on the other aspect of things, we have, um, we need experience. We, we need a, a relationship, something tangible. We need an experience with God, experiences with God as we go about life where we can we can walk away and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God heard my prayer, that he was with me, that he was in, he was with me in this particular instance. And it was only God and God alone that got me through or that answered the prayer or that worked behind the scenes. Um, and David had both of those in his life. He had the word, but he also has ex had experiences with God. So let me direct your attention to one more passage in First Chronicles chapter 21. In First Chronicles chapter 21, David has a very interesting encounter with God. It's, it's more of a negative disciplinary encounter, but it's an encounter nonetheless. And David had some positive ones. He had some negative ones. But no matter what, David had a heart to really seek the Lord. Um, and he, he wasn't permanently scarred as a result of this encounter. So, and this is a very interesting one. I, I'm not sure how many of you know this, 
But I personally believe that David saw Jesus, his pre-incarnate form, a thousand years before Christ would actually come to earth in a human fleshly body. And you'll pick that up here in a moment. So First Chronicles chapter 21, I'm going to read just a story in the life of David before I conclude. Verse 8, then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. He's talking about um, <clears throat> David had issued an order to count all the fighting men of Israel. And that was really a revelation of his heart trusting in his own um, his own military force for protection and not trusting in God. It's kind of a violation of his personal covenant with God. And so he says, I, I've sinned. He's confessed, I've sinned in doing this. Now I beg you. Take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. The Lord said to Gad, David's seer, or David's prophet, go tell David this. This is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. You pick one of those for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said, this is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine, three months of being swept away by your enemies, or three days of a plague on the land directly by the hand of the Lord. <clears throat> with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now, this is this phrase, the angel of the Lord, is very significant. It appears multiple times in the Old Testament. Scholars are almost unanimously unanimous in their belief based upon the attributes attributed to the angel of the Lord that this is Jesus in a form that he took before his coming a thousand years later. All right. Um, now then decide who, uh, how I should answer the one who sent me. And David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. It's best, better for me to fall into the hands of the Lord. So I'll pick option number three, three days of famine. So verse, verse 14 in first Chronicles chapter one says this. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to, and angel. Now it doesn't say the angel of the Lord anymore. It says an angel. But as the angel was, do, was doing so, the Lord said to it, saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying the people, enough, withdraw your hand. And the angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth. So I'm assuming the angel of the Lord was did not have his feet touching the earth, but was in the sky, you know, between heaven and earth, with a sword drawn in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell face down. David said to God, was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong, but these are just sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family, you know, not on the people. They're innocent. Then in verse 18, the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that God had spoken in the name of the Lord. And while Aruna was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel as well, his four sons who were with him, and they hid themselves. Then David approached and Aruna looked and saw him. He left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face to the ground. And David said to him, let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. Aruna says, no, just take it. But he says, hey, listen, I am not going to take anything for free. I insist on paying full price. <clears throat> I will not take for the Lord what is yours or a sacrifice of burnt offering that costs me nothing. That's verse 24. So David paid Aruna 600 shekels of gold for the site, and David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. So Elijah was not the only person to witness fire miraculously fall from heaven upon and burn up um, an offering. David also. Saw fire miraculously fall from heaven um, and, and burn up his offering. So this is another miraculous proof. Not only did he see the angel of the Lord, 
but he saw fire fall from heaven to burn up the offering. <clears throat> and it just so happens that this very site is Mount Moriah, which is where the temple was to be built. And ultimately, a thousand years later, this is the very place where Jesus himself, it's, it's funny that Jesus is here a thousand years before, because a thousand years after this occurrence, Jesus is going to be standing in the same spot. Um, and he's going to offer himself up as an atonement for, for sin. And we're going to see the mercy and wrath of God um, meet in, in Christ. And that's what we're kind of seeing here. God's wrath is being poured out. And the only thing that can assuage his wrath is to <clears throat> prepare this, this offering, um, this, to build this altar and prepare an offering. Then the Lord spoke to the angel and he put his sword back in its sheath. At that time, when David saw the Lord, he answered him on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Oh, at that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, he offered sacrifices there. Um, all right. So there are a number of people in the Bible Gideon, um, Abraham, Joshua. There's a number of people who, who had encounters with the angel of the Lord. And on many occasions, the angel of the Lord is given divine attributes. And the one verse that's not found here in this particular passage, but is found a couple chapters later on in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, which is a summary of this event. <clears throat> uh, it provides greater clarity as to whom, whom David was actually interacting with. And in 2 Chronicles 3, 1, it says, Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father, David. Where the Lord, doesn't say an angel, it says where the Lord had appeared to his father, David. So, based upon that verse, and what we know of the angel of the Lord throughout multiple Old Testament passages, I have arrived at the conclusion, as have others, that David actually encountered Jesus in a form before Jesus permanent coming to the earth in you know in human form. Um, so David experienced God in good times, and he also experienced God, as you can see, God's anger or discipline at times. But that didn't stop him from seeking God with all his heart and recognizing even through the good and the bad, that God was the ultimate source of fulfillment in his life, of satisfaction in his life. So <clears throat> I'm kind of thinking, I'm doing an, a, a brief assessment of my own heart. Is my heart devoted to seeking the Lord? And I would say in this season, no. All right, why not? Um, I feel like. I'm distracted. I feel like I'm pulled in a number of different directions. Um, I will even admit at times I feel kind of uninterested, maybe in my distraction for other things or my interest in other things, or perhaps even the temptation to primarily look to the wedding for my sense of satisfaction rather than the groom himself, even though I know that's ultimately futile. Um, and that, that, that does concern me. You know, it concerns me that I want to have a heart that's 100% totally, completely committed to seeking God. And I, I want God to respond um, and, and reveal himself in the word, but also his presence in everyday life, his presence through prayer, you know, as I apply his, his principles and as I seek him and rely upon him, we, we should see evidence of God's activity in our lives. It's like, that's what I was comparing with going to the actual football game. You know, it's experiencing God firsthand, not just reading about him, but, but experiencing him personally. So my cry is really that God would give me a greater heart this fall, this winter, as things outside slow down, as we lose more and more light, you know, um, I, my prayer is that God would give me a heart to truly uh, 
begin to seek him at a, at a greater and deeper level. That ultimately my, my satisfaction would be found in, in Christ alone, in the groom. And that would be my ultimate source of strength. You know, even when David was going through everything that he was going through in Psalm 17, he kind of ends on this, this exciting, happy, hope-centered uh, verse. And that was, that was writing down the facts that he was confident would, in fact, take place in the future and would, would, would be instrumental in experiencing true satisfaction. Um, something that's eluded him, you know, on, on this, on this earth. So my prayer for you, my prayer for all of us today. And I know you've you heard this so many times. It kind of gets old. It's like I preach a lot of messages about the word um, and about having pursuing a divine experience, divine relationship where God is present. God is working. We, we sense him. But I think ultimately I've arrived after 19 years of traveling this path. You know, I'm not at my final destination. I long to be in God's timing. But until then, my heart still wants that fullness, even though I know it's, it's, it can't permanently take place until I arrive. But my heart still wants it as I travel this, this difficult road. And I'm seeking it. I know it's futile to seek it in the world. It's temporary. It doesn't last. A lot of times Satan dangles things in front of us to try to get us distracted to pursue things that really are just going to leave us more empty than ever before. Um, but my prayer is that God would, would give all of us a heart to really hunger after his word, to know him, and a heart to pray and talk with him throughout the day and depend upon him and invite him to be a part of our lives so that we see his activity. On a, on a weekly basis, and we can confidently declare, like, hey, I don't need to guess about, no, this is not just faith, it's, I know, I know God, like, I know he's, I'm walking with him, and he's walking with me, because here's the testimony, Here, here's, here's what he's been doing, here's what he's up to, and these things could not have happened unless God was intervening. So, I don't know if you want to push pause, I mean, this is, this is the end here. Um, perhaps you might like to uh, take a few moments as this message kind of ends to uh, share some thoughts before concluding in a um, in, in a time of prayer. So sorry I couldn't be with you this this Sunday. Um, look forward to next Sunday back with my family. But in my absence uh, and in reflection upon last week's wedding. My heart has really been toward seeking the groom, seeking the groomsman and finding my sense of ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment in the groom alone. All right. Bless you guys. Love you. And uh, we'll see you. We'll see you next Sunday.